you know, welcome back from your break. Uh, we are sort of ready to start our next session. The next session is um, on AI in healthcare. And our first speaker is Jonathan Liu. Jonathan is an MD student. Uh, he's also part of the BMI graduate program and he's affiliated uh, with Nigam Shah's lab. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great, uh, let me just share screen right now. And I know uh, the, these are pretty short lightning talks, so I will try to keep it brief. Um, but um, this is uh, reliability and fairness audits of clinical AI models using star OMOP. And ju just sanity check is, can everyone hear me right now and see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, as you can see, met, uh, this involved the work of many people all listed here. So uh, definitely not, um, informatics is definitely not a, uh, or is definitely a team sport. Um, uh, quick, quick inspiration for, for this work is um, from Margaret Mitchell and Timnit Gebru came out with this paper about model cards for model reporting to increase transparency into AI technology. And they're also actually um, unjustly fired by Google when they were raising concerns about some of the harms from deploying AI without consideration of the impact on people. Um, an, a, other inspiration is from Inolua Deborah Raji, who uh, I, I, at least in my mind coined the term of, of auditing a model. And uh, what we are hoping to do in this work is uh, to audit the model. But uh, for, for some quick background is that, uh, I, I, as you all probably know, uh, AI models have been deployed without um, reliable fairness. This is um, an example of, uh, um, I think the deter deterioration index uh, being deployed without validation. Uh, and y'all are probably familiar with Ziad Obermeyer's work looking at an insurance algorithm um, that uh, exhibited racial bias toward black patients compared to white patients. And uh, one way that our literature has tried to address this is by coming out with these model reporting guidelines. This is an example, which uh, really communicates what it, some of the important properties of a model like how, how, how well did it do for different data sets? So this is from Dr. Sendak. Tricky part is that there are uh, 15 of these have been published since 2012, um, but actually only one of these was complete for a model in use for a health system. This was uh, the sepsis model at Duke. Um, so we wanted to check if models that are actually used uh, by Epic adhere to these guidelines. And um, uh, uh, this is all summarizing some previous work, but the takeaway, a third of them did external validation. There were no confidence intervals and there were also not a lot of calibration plots, which are an important plot for understanding the model output compared to the true probability of the outcome. There were also low reporting of, we're missing our table ones. So we're missing like information on sex and ethnicity and race. And we're also missing subgroup analyses for how these performs for different groups. Um, so the question I'd like, uh, we wanted to answer in this work is how hard it is, is it to actually do things um, for a model that is actually being used? Uh, so in our case, we are considering two models used to support advanced care planning, na namely to flag patients who are at high risk of passing away within the next year um, so that um, there can be an advanced care planning conversation and intervention to make sure that they receive goal concordant, uh, care that is concordant with their goals. Um, so we have the Epic End of Life Index, um, which has uh, logistic regression, runs for all patients within the health system. Uh, and we have uh, this, uh, the Stanford Hospital Medicine ACP model, which is currently being used in the hospital medicine unit um, to flag hospitalized patients and prioritize them for advanced care planning or AC. Um, and a quick, quick like bird's eye view of, of what this involved. We had to ask clinicians for labels. This was an announcement slide um, in primary care asking, notifying clinicians that we'd be asking them to answer, to generate this as a label because we don't, we don't wanna wait a year. Uh, uh, we don't have access to direct 12 month mortality labels at this point. Um, but so we got clinician labels, we linked them with model predictions, demographics, and a way to link relevant clinicians with relevant patients, uh, perform our audit, and then we tried to say how hard it was to do this overall. Um, and in the results, uh, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna highlight some key takeaways. So this is an example looking at the end of life index 
uh, in inpatient oncology. First thing that's important to do is summary statistics. Uh, as you can tell for um, Hispanic patients, even when you disaggregate by sex, there's generally not a significant difference in the prevalence of a label. And that's important because um, as, as we stated earlier, if you have differences in the outcome proxy, if you use outcomes such as like cost that are differing for different groups, the models that you use to about the models that you train and evaluate can, can be biased just from differences in the outcome label. So this was a good sanity check. Uh, secondly, it's good to do subgroup performances. Um, sensitivity was low for Hispanic patients, but especially for Hispanic male patients. And in fact, the model was missing all 13 patients that were flagged by clinicians. Um, so, so that's really important. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, it's important to do calibration plots, which plot the model score against um, the probability of the outcome to help us understand how the model is performing at different thresholds. And this actually explains why there is lower sensitivity for Hispanic males, because the model is systematically giving lower uh, risk scores compared to overall. Um, but uh, I wouldn't take all that too seriously because probably all these results are wrong because uh, if the, uh, the race and ethnicity variable in our electronic health records is pretty poorly fit, not just at Stanford Family Medicine, but even in the Optum and Healthcare Cost Utilization Project, which really is to show like, it all really with data work, not the model work. But yeah, there was 100% mis- for Hispanic and Latinx patients in the Stanford Family Medicine and 37% overall. So uh, just be really wary of uh, the claims that you make from this data. Um, so uh, in, in conclusion, what is what do you need to do this? You only need three things. You need clinician labels and model predictions. And actually the, an important part is linking clinicians with relevant patients, because it doesn't make sense to ask a hospitalist to, act, to, answer, to perform labeling you know, for um, a patient seen like six months ago. Uh, and lastly, it's important to get patient demographics. And for two out of four things, uh, they were directly enabled by STAR OMA. So like looking at recent visits and patient panels, we needed that for primary care and we need a table in STAR OMA. So this is STAR OMA with a, a superhero because they're the real hero. Uh, but that's really um, the end of my presentation. Uh, and th thank a bunch to Nitin and Priya who are, who are the real stars of the show um, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, please, if you don't mind waiting for, you know, waiting around because what I'm noticing is people are, are posting questions in the Q&A like a few minutes later. So uh, if you can, you know, just wait and, and monitor that, um, we can actually go to our next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Louis Blankemeyer. He's a PhD student in the EE department and affiliated with Dr. Akshay Chaudhary's lab. So um, Louis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me just make sure that this works. Can you guys see this first slide? Yep, we can. And then uh, you see a change? Yep. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some uh, very preliminary research that we're, we've done on opportunistic computed tomography. Um, this was a very collaborative effort within the Machine Intelligence for Medical Imaging Lab, um, where the PI is Akshay Shadhari. So what is opportunistic uh, computed tomography? Um, there's 20 million abdominal CT scans. Um, sorry about that, I uh, performed annually in the US. And these CT scans are very information dense. There are 3D volumes of the abdomen. Um, so each of these scans presents an opportunity for uh, risk assessment of diseases and early detection. Um, and our goal is to really go beyond what radiologists current, currently do. Um, so as people have uh, brought up, um, we can do automation or uh, augmentation. And, and this is kind of more in that augmentation realm. Um, so what we were interested in looking at uh, for this work was given a CT scan from a patient that does not have a disease, we want to predict whether they will develop uh, the disease within five years. 
And we were interested in doing this for ischemic heart disease, chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, and we chose these diseases because we uh, hypothesized that they would be easy to predict using CT scans. Um, and we could take some actions to improve patient care based on the outputs that we get. So just to briefly uh, summarize our STAR cohort, um, we acquired CT exams and EHR for 9,154 patients. Um, and these patients presented to our ter tertiary center emergency department uh, between January 2013 and May 2018. And each of these patients received at least one abdominal CT scan. Um, so then with the electronic health records, we were able to uh, place CTs into one of three classes. So the point that of this table is to show that for each of these diseases, we have different numbers of scans in each of um, three different categories. So one category is patients that had the disease before their CT scan, um, patients that never developed the disease uh, while we were tracking their EHR, and patients that developed the disease following their CT scan. And uh, for our task, we were just interested in looking at the developed and never developed categories. Um, so we have a binary classification desk. Um, we also, uh, based on some previous research, um, realized that uh, representing CT images as 2D representations um, decreased the computational complexity of our models um, and often outperformed 3D volumes. Uh, but we also wanted a way to extract maximum information from these CT scans. Uh, so this slide might be a little bit busy, um, but the top row shows that we start with a 3D CT volume. Um, and then in the second box in the top row, um, we compute a maximum intens intensity projection, which just takes the maximum pixel in uh, this like front, front view. Um, and then we can use a model to determine where a uh, certain level is in the spine. Um, so that's, that's shown by the dashed red line. Um, and this gives us an axial slice uh, from the CT exam, uh, which is shown in the next square over um, and has the red uh, boundary around it. And this axial slice has been shown to be predictive of uh, several um, diseases and there's lots of biomarkers in it. Um, and then going over to the box on the far right uh, upper row, we uh, show how we segment out the spine and aorta from this L3 axial slice. And this gives us both a sagittal slice and a coronal slice uh, indicated by the dashed uh, green and blue lines. Um, and then the bottom row shows that we can take the axial slice that we get, uh, concatenate this with a sagittal slice and then concatenate with a coronal slice and we can use um, these to predict uh, risk of five, these five diseases. Um, and then just to reiterate this process, so we first um, locate an L3 axial slice using this kind of architecture shown on the top. Um, so we have a maximum intensity projection of the CT scan on the left, and then on the right, we output a softmax over vertical locations uh, of these, this image, which indicate where this axial slice uh, is located. Um, and then the bottom of this uh, slide shows that we segment this axial slice um, to find the aorta and spine. And then this gives us the sagittal and coronal slices. Um, and then this is the image that goes into our model. So. Um, on the left, we have our L3 axial slice, and then the center, we have a coronal or a sagittal slice. And then on the right, there's a coronal slice. And then we also thought that this would be a exciting place to try to apply multitask learning. Um, this chart shows that there are high comorbidity relationships between um, these diseases. So the size of each of these nodes shows the prevalence of these diseases. And then the uh, color of the arrows between them show comorbidities. Um, and uh, these diseases are known to share common risk factors. Um, so we think that representations uh, should uh, be able to be shared between these.
So now I'll just show some uh, results. So if we go to the leftmost column, um, if we look at different configurations, so for our input, so just using an axial slice, um, we show on the top row, and then just using a coronal slice, using a single sagittal slice, and then MP stands for multiplanar. So this is the approach where you have all three multi, uh, all three planes concatenated together. And then the bottom row show, shows complete multitest learning. So this is just learning with all of these diseases at the same time, plus uh, multiplanar. Um, and we see you actually can't quite, there's not too much of a difference, um, but it seems like multiplanar learning actually does best uh, where each disease is learned separately with a different model um, overall. <clears throat> But then we still hypothesize there, there should be some benefit in multitask learning um, in certain cases. Um, so we developed a validation strategy where we determine which diseases are best trained together. Um, and then we also looked at if we're in the sparse label regime, um, does multitask learning uh, help? So <clears throat> the far uh, left column again shows single task learning, so STL with 10% of training labels. Um, and then multitask learning with 10% of training labels, uh, single task learning with 100% of training labels, and then multitask learning with 100% of training labels. And then I think the important parts to look at um, for this table are the two rightmost columns. So um, this second to rightmost column shows percent change uh, when we go from single task to multitask learning. Um, and within this 10% label regime, we see a 5% improvement. And then this, <clears throat> excuse me, decreases to 2.4% uh, when we have, um, <clears throat> when we use all of our labels. And then the far right most column shows percent change um, when we go from uh, fully supervised learning. So this is just single task learning with 100% of labels um, to the other configurations. And we see here that you just lose 0.3% um, of performance when you go to 10% of labels um, using multitask learning. Um, so this shows us uh, some benefit of learning uh, risk of these diseases uh, at once in a uh, uh, kind of smart way. Um, and I know I'm, I'm brushing over a lot of details here, so feel free to uh, ask any questions um, if you have them. I know that these are supposed to be kind of quick talks. Um, so then we wanted to know, could we use electronic health records as well to predict these diseases. Um, and this just shows some, some results for ischemic heart disease. Um, so we used XGBoost um, with vitals, labs, diagnoses, uh, medications, and procedures, um, a, a neural network tabular model uh, called SAINT, um, which did slightly worse than XGBoost, um, just a fully connected network, which again did uh, a little bit worse. And then PCE, which is pooled cohort equations, um, which are a commonly used uh, risk stratification score for um, cardiovascular disease. And this did uh, a little bit worse than the other methods. Um, so we think there's some areas, or these are areas that we're currently working on and we have some preliminary uh, results for, um, but I think this is all important to keep developing uh, for this work to be clinically useful. Um, <clears throat> So we are interested in really uh, augmenting our models using a multimodal approach. So integrating the EHR data with our imaging data and also looking into other modalities. Um, and then we definitely want to make our risk prediction models actionable. Um, and I think this is only possible if we have uh, good explainability methods. So when we get a risk score, we know what's uh, contributing to that score and then we can um, have the clinician act on, on that part of uh, the issue. And then um, we also want to know when we cannot trust our prediction models. Um, and uh, I think this is very important. Uh, otherwise, I think it'd be hard to just take a prediction at uh, face value. Um, and then model fairness across subpopulations. Uh, and then another area is just developing a clinical interface and understanding how best to make these models uh, interact with clinicians um, so they're actually useful. And so I want to acknowledge um, a bunch of people that have contributed to this work. 
Um, and also thank the entire uh, Mimi group at Stanford and my dissertation advisor, Dr. Akshay Shadhari. Um, so thanks. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask. Thank you, Louis. Uh, please post any questions that you may have in the Q and A, um, and I think we can move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nima Gipur. He is the associate professor um, uh, of research at, uh, of anesthesiology, perioperative, and pain medicine of pediatrics and by courtesy of biomedical data science. Uh, Nima, we're really looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to talk about preterm birth, which is the single largest cause of death in children under five years of age, both in high income and in low income countries. Beyond preterm birth, what happens during the course of pregnancy has has long-term consequences for the baby well into adulthood. So it's important to ensure that um, pregnancy happens in, a, in, in an optimum environment. In my day job, we use various biological modalities and omics assays to try to understand the biological pathways that contribute to preterm birth. And despite significant investments in this area, we still haven't moved the needle on a global health um, scale sufficiently. And um, that made me think, um, rethink our definition of preterm birth. Additionally, we have been defining preterm birth as gestational age under 37 weeks. And then we have been using um, our research platforms to try to understand the biological mechanisms of that. But as a non-physician, one of my questions was why 37 and why gestational age? It turns out that these concepts come from mortality rates from historic studies several decades ago, often in Europe, where they figured out that there is kind of a bend in the mortality curve around 37 weeks. And they called that preterm birth and that definition kind of stuck around as it often happens in medicine. And now we are all trying to resolve that. But in reality, we know that preterm birth um, itself is not really a homogeneous problem to try to work on. Neonatal mortality comes from various neonatal morbidities in different organs, including hemorrhages in the brain and complications in the guts and, and inflammation problems and so on. But we can't really treat this as, as just one disease. So again, traditionally, we have these definitions of term birth, preterm birth, maybe extreme preterm birth. And this is how we make many of our decisions in, um, in, in, in the neonatal intensive care units these days. But in reality, we have babies that are born early and are just fine. And we have babies that are born after 37 weeks and are still at risk of various morbidities. But we can't really just go with these simple buckets and, and hope for the best. So the first study that we did was using claims data we found a number of demographic and, and medical history information and so on, when, and we linked all of that to various neonatal morbidities. So we have data on the mother, we have neonatal morbidities of the baby, and we can easily plug all of these into a multitask neural network to see if we can make reasonable predictions. And immediately with this already very simple data set, we were doing pretty well. So again, we have all of our measurements on the left, we have these neonatal morbidities in blue, you're trying to make a multitask prediction. This was all fairly straightforward. We ended up building a model on 1 million, testing it on 10 million patient reports. And we were already doing far better than gestational age. This is preterm birth. This is extreme preterm birth. This is a small for gestational age. That's fantastic. The only problem is that when you look at precision and recall, even though it's better than gestational age, it's not anywhere near good enough to be used in a precision medicine approach. The next step for us was to add biology into this. We have um, metabolites from dry blood spots measured in 13,000 extremely preterm infants that we were able to link to the data set that I showed you earlier. 
And by adding biology to the same multitask neural network pipeline, again, fairly straightforward analysis, we were able to solve our precision recall problem. Now we have pretty good precision and pretty good recall for these data sets, both for a holdout validation and for cross-validation. One of these, just as an example, necrotizing enterocolitis is a complication that is often diagnosed several weeks after birth. And by the time that it's diagnosed, your only recourse is, is a pretty aggressive surgery, often with poor outcomes. But here we are showing that we can predict it at birth and there are interventions available for it, including the use mm -hmm. of antibiotics and delayed feeding and so on to try to prevent that eventual surgery with poor outcomes. So we are, we are quite excited about this. The next step for us was to connect this to the, to the star OMAP information. So we built a linkage between the children's hospital OMAP data and the adult hospital OMAP data. What that gave us was on the left, information on the mother, including a bucket of ICD-10 codes and procedures and, and lab values and, and all of that. And on the right from, from the children's hospital, we have this web of neonatal morbidities that happen after birth. So again, we wanted to connect these two pieces together through multitask learning. But before that, we had to deal with the longitudinal nature of the data. So we have the maternal electronic health record. At some point, a newborn electronic health record is added to this. Before we can push it through our multitask learning, we have to push it through a long short-term memory neural network. For those of you that are not familiar, this, this pipeline basically deals with longitudinal data. The same way that you, when you read a book, you don't memorize every single word of it. An LSTM doesn't memorize the entirety of the electronic health record of a patient. It only memorizes key concepts that are relevant to the eventual prediction that we need to make. That ended up working pretty well. On the right, you have um, area under the curve. On the left, you have area under precision recall compared to a random classifier to account for class imbalance. Here is necrotizing enterocolitis that I already told you about. We can make a pretty, we can make predict it pretty good at birth, but excitingly, we can also predict it before birth, before there is even a baby to do anything about. Similarly, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, a complication in, in the lungs, so we can predict it at birth and before birth. And of course, after birth, data continues to roll in um, from the NICUs and our models become more and more accurate as more data rolls in. Here is an example from one patient. A red check mark means a diagnosis that they ended up getting. A green cross means a diagnosis that they didn't get. And um, this worked surprisingly well. At uh, a couple of weeks before birth, we have already figured out that this patient is going to get diagnosed with sepsis one month after birth. And you know, same with BPD and ROP and so on. And all these things that they ended up not getting diagnosed with, again, we got them right a couple of weeks before birth already. This is exciting because it gives our healthcare system and, and the NICUs much needed time to prepare for, for any interventions that, they, that they're going to need. One example that didn't work so well was IVH. The, they got an IVH diagnosis and our algorithm disagrees with that, or at least thinks that it's not the most high risk thing. Turns out after seeing this plot, I learned that IVH has grades. It's not all cases of IVH are created equally. And again, our algorithm was automatically learning the grades of IVH, even though we had set this up as a classification, it was already figuring out that all these IVH cases are not created equal. When you look at how the model works, it's looking at <clears throat> um, insulin use in the mother, for example, antihypertensive use, even history of chemotherapy. This is not during pregnancy, history of chemotherapy several years before pregnancy, perhaps. Plenty of, plenty of other factors and uh, even, even social determinants of health, including incarceration and homelessness. This is for um, neck. I can show you the same plot for a different condition. And if I go back and forth between these, you start seeing differences already. For example, here, this one is vitamin B complex use, which normally is considered safe for pregnancy doesn't affect preterm birth. They are right, it doesn't affect preterm birth, but it does affect the specific morbidities in the babies that, um, that we should be very careful about. 
I told you about um, incarceration and homelessness. Typically, we think typically we think about um, social determinants of health and socioeconomic status as just one bucket. Turns out that these are not just one bucket, and homelessness has a completely different effect on the babies, particularly on necrotizing enterocolitis and neck uh, 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 gut condition that um, potentially has a linkage to microbiome. Um, changes and so on, whereas incarceration doesn't have that effect. So you can't really think of social determinants of health as one bucket of socioeconomic status. You really have to be able to dissect that. You can find um, medications that are having a protective effect or a harmful effect on the baby, medications that the mother is taking, as well as, of course, sources of indication bias, like in the medicine. But there are also plenty of medications that appear to be um, protective, which we are quite excited about. Similarly, from lab values, we are seeing that mothers with a stronger immune system are giving birth to babies that are protected across the board in their brain, in their guts, in, in their lungs, are, are protected. Um, against various morbidities. So a higher lymphocyte count, for example, has a, has a negative odds ratio for various conditions. Similarly, albumin, perhaps as a measure for nutrition status, across the board has a very strong protective effect for the baby. Again, this is albumin levels in the mother. So we are, um, of course, not going to stop here. We have a lot more work ahead of us, plenty of other data modalities that we are in the process of integrating into the model, as well as plenty of other complications in the, in the babies and in the mothers, both short-term and long-term, that um, we are in the process of adding to the model gradually. A long list of people to thank, including everybody in the lab, alumni, um, my, um, my colleagues in the pediatrics department, David Stevenson, Gary Shaw, uh, Carl Sylvester, various colleagues at the Gates Foundation, Martin Angst, Chris Godelier, uh, Mar Maria Sierota from UCSF, who has helped us validate some of these models already in the UC system. I didn't have time to show you that. And the STAR and RIC teams, without whom none of these would have been possible, as well as funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Nima. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Any questions? That was a really cool talk. Thank you. Um, let's, I, I think people may post in the Q&A, but let's uh, keep moving on just in the interest of time. Uh, our next speaker is Connor Corbin. Uh, Connor is a PhD student at the DBMI, uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics, and he is part of uh, Jonathan Chen's lab. All right, thanks so much. You all can hear me and see my slides. Perfect. So it's well, actually- Connor, if I can just interrupt us. Uh, Nima, I think there's a question for you. That's all in the Q&A. Go ahead, my bad. Um, do you want me to answer the question or? Um, no, I mean, you could answer it in just the Q&A since they didn't okay. ask right. it when, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll answer it. Yeah. Connor. Right. Connor, so cool. go ahead, Connor. Sorry about that. No worries at all. All right, so yes, I'm a, I'm a fourth year PMI PhD student working with Jonathan Chen. We're talking about a STAR project uh, involving data-driven antibiotic selection. So it's fairly easy to take for granted that we're living in kind of a special era in human history, the era of antibiotics, where in days we can treat infections that previously had wiped out populations. And in today's world, we use antibiotics to do more than just treat onset infection. In fact, many modern day medical practices require antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent infections. So things like organ transplant, surgery, cancer care, HIV treatment, really anything that compromises a patient's immune system can require antibiotics. Now, there have been rumors of a post-antibiotic era, except you could very well argue that we are already here. So this is a case report 
uh, where a woman showed up to a Nevada hospital in 2016 with a particular strain of Klebs yellow pneumonia that was resistant to all available antibiotics. She later developed septic shock and died. And unfortunately, this is becoming more and more common. So today, the CDC estimates that over 9,000 Americans a year are infected by carbapenem-resistant enterobacter. These are agents that are, again, resistant to all or nearly all available antibiotics. Drug-resistant gonorrhea infects 250,000 Americans a year. C. diff kills 14,000. And MRSA kills a little over 11,000. Today, the World Health Organization estimates that 700,000 people worldwide die due to antibiotic resistant infection per year. And this number is only trending upward. So by 2050, just three decades from now, the annual death toll is expected to reach 10 million. To put that into perspective, that's a little bit more than the current annual death toll due to cancer. And it's not like we didn't have warning either. So back in 45, when Alexander Fleming won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of penicillin, he's quoted for saying that the thoughtless person playing with antibiotic treatment should be held morally responsible for the death of the person who succumbs to antibiotic resistant infection. Yet even so, today in primary care offices, it's estimated that one in three antibiotics are given in situations where they won't work, so the patient shows up with the flu. And even in hospitals, it's estimated that up to 50% of antibiotic use is either unwarranted or suboptimal. Either they didn't need antibiotics or something broader, more last line was given when something more narrow uh, would have sufficed. So why is this so hard? Why are we getting this so wrong? And one of the biggest reasons is that in healthcare settings, antibiotics are delivered under a state of uncertainty. So here's an example workflow. Say a patient shows up to the emergency room with suspected infection. The first thing that a clinician is going to do is order a set of microbial cultures, which is the definitive diagnostic test that goes on to elucidate the causal organism and a set of antibiotics that will work and will not work against that infection. The issue is that this diagnostic test, the microbial cultures, still today average a two to three day turnaround. And if a patient is particularly sick in front of you, two to three days is way too long to wait to begin uh, treatment. So at the same time that clinicians are ordering these microbial cultures, they're prescribing antibiotics empirically, which is essentially a euphemism for clinicians looking at guidelines, local resistance patterns, presenting symptoms to come up with their best guess as to what the causal agent is and what the appropriate antibiotic regimen would be. And so the point of this project is to try to develop a support system that would intervene here at day one when clinicians are under this state of uncertainty and need to prescribe appropriate empiric treatments. All right, so in words, our objective at day one, conditioned on positive culture growth, we're going to use electronic medical record data to predict the antibiotic susceptibility results, predict the diagnostic test that gets ordered every time a patient has, is suspected with infection. We're then going to use these predicted probabilities, these models, to optimize antibiotic selections over sets of patients. And then we're going to try to estimate treatment efficacy when the optimizer uh, is al only allowed uh, fewer sets of these big gun last line antibiotics. So to do this, we built a cohort. Uh, we included patients who went to the hospital, through the emergency room, who had microbial cultures and empiric antibiotics ordered for them within the first 24 hours of the encounter. This gave us about a little over 8,000 uh, admissions. We trained 12 different binary classifiers. Each one was estimating the, the probability that a particular antibiotic regimen would work for that patient using the microbial culture susceptibility results as labels. We train models using fairly standardized approaches, using bags of words representations of diagnosis codes, procedures, medication orders, lab results, vital signs. We use standard model classes, standard splitting mechanisms, 
And we received AUCs that range between 0.61 and 0.73, which is low. This is not an inpatient mortality task, but you can expect 0.95 AUC every time. So the question becomes, is this useful? And to address that, we had to develop a method that would allow us to use the out of sample predicted probabilities to optimize antibiotic assignments over sets of patients. And so let N be the number of patients in our held out test set. Let M be the number of antibiotic options. This is the number of models we have, which in this case is 12. And let phi be a matrix of antibiotic efficacy estimates over our test set. So this is an N by M matrix that essentially has our out of sample predicted probabilities from our model. We're then gonna let S be a matrix of binary decision variables where SIJ is one if the Jth antibiotic is to be given to the Ith patient and zero otherwise. And then we're just gonna to try to choose an S that maximizes the total predicted efficacy of antibiotics over our set of patients. And we're gonna do so with a couple constraints. First constraint is that we're only going to allow one antibiotic regimen to be given to any given patient. And the second is that we're going to constrain the total number of times that a particular antibiotic is given to a patient. This is important because the naive solution to this problem is to just give the most broad spectrum last line antibiotic to everyone. But clearly that's not the most optimal thing to do as the more you give these broad spectrum last line drugs to people, the quicker you develop resistance to them. So really it's this double-edged sword of where of you wanting to maximize coverage across your set of patients, but you wanna do so with the narrowest Spec narrowest possible spectrum antibiotic. And so these budget parameters are things that we control in this optimization procedure. And a reasonable starting point is to fix them to be what doctors actually use. So we have our test set of patients, we know what doctors actually gave them. So we can count out the number of times that doctors gave certain antibiotics, and that can be a starting point budget. But then what's neat is we can then go on and perturb these budget parameters to estimate the performance of our optimizer as it's forced to prescribe fewer broad spectrum drugs in favor of more narrow spectrum drugs. And so we can do this and create a bunch of plots that look like this. And I may be running a little short on time, but I will try to go over this. You're fine, Connor, go ahead. I'm fine, perfect. Um, so on the y-axis here is coverage rate. It's the fraction of patients in the test set who were covered by the antibiotic option that was given to them. This first dashed black line is clinician performance. So it's the fraction of patients who were covered by the antibiotic given to them by clinicians in real life. This second dashed horizontal line, the gray one on the bottom is random performance. So take the antibiotics that were given to patients, randomly shuffle them, compute uh, who, which, which patients were covered, that's random performance. This uh, solid line is the optimized solution. And at the very top left, it's the optimized solution when the budget parameters match what clinicians were actually used. And then as you go down to the right on this plot, you see how the coverage rate changes for the optimized solution as it's allowed, or as it uses fewer and fewer of the relatively more broad spectrum drug in favor of the relatively more narrow spectrum drug. In this plot, it's swapping vancomycin and piptazo for just piptazo, hold the vanc. And so you can conceivably do this for every combination of a relatively more broad to a relatively more narrow spectrum antibiotic. And we've done that. Here are three. And what's neat is that you can then point to a, a particular position on this plot, this vertical line here, where the optimized solution reaches clinician performance. And so we can say the optimized solution matched clinician performance while using 70% fewer of the relatively more broad spectrum drug. So if this has piqued your interest, we have a, a paper that came out um, a little bit over a month ago in Nature Communications Medicine, so you can go and read it. Um, I'm gonna stop here um, and take questions. Thanks.
That was really interesting. I will go and read the paper. Thank you. Um, thank you, Connor. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Elsie uh, Ross. Um, Elsie is an assistant professor of surgery, um, vascular surgery, uh, and of medicine at, at Beamer. Um, Elsie, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? and see my slides, great. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Um, so I will say that I'll be the first to admit that the title of this talk is very melodramatic, um, but if you're around last year or the year before, you've learned, you may have heard of some of the um, growing pains of building a lab as a junior faculty and learning things like computing, um, moving your computing uh, resources from on-premises to Google Cloud, and then um, what does a data science lab do when you're actually given like patient genetic data um, that you thought was going to be coded in ones and zeros, but actually is a saliva sample. So um, in this talk, I hope to kind of update everyone on what's gone on um, with us in terms of analyzing data using um, STAR, RIT, and RIC uh, resources. So I have no relevant disclosures. And a brief recap, if you have no idea who I am, I'm a vascular surgeon, and I spent a lot of time treating peripheral artery disease. Um, so PAD um, is is a disease process for which there's narrowing of arteries in the lower leg, uh, primarily, um, where that causes uh, significant morbidity in terms of patient's ability to walk and can lead to um, leg amputations. And so as a surgeon, I spend a lot of time trying to prevent this, um, but I think a lot of the care is suboptimal. Like as much as I enjoy being a surgeon and operating, I think patients would be much better served if we diagnose their PAD much earlier, um, put them on the right medications such as uh, statins and aspirin to um, prevent them from coming to see me. Um, and so <laughs> while I spend some time operating, I spend the rest of my time um, doing research and working with wonderful students and postdocs um, to look at how we can use data science to improve care for patients with PAD. So a lot of the work we do is really anchored on using electronic health records to gain insights and predict outcomes. But I think there are a few times in um, a professor's career when they're allowed to leave, they're given leeway to kind of explore multiple different angles. I think one of them is when you're early, um, people give you some leeway. And then once you've built an outstanding, phenomenal career, then people let you kind of go off the deep end to explore some other things. So um, I'm on the early stage. And so one of the things I was interested in is what other data besides electronic health records could be used to improve our detection of PAD. Um, so one question um, we had was, can genetics help us improve our ability to detect um, PAD? patients. Um, and this uh, came together as um, using data from uh, large data banks like the Million Veterans Project and UK Biobank to build what's known as a summarized genetic risk score or a polygenic risk score. And what we found um, using these data sets um, were that if you use a genome-wide polygenic risk score, so you're looking across the whole genome and then averaging uh, genetic risk and you um, control for age and sex, then you can build um, um, a classifier that's okay in its performance. If you add other clinical risk factors such as high blood pressure, um, BMI, um, and other um, comorbidities, you can improve the, um, you know, a, some metrics of the model, such as AUC, and the information it's giving you through R squared. And then if you add what's known as the, our, the polygenic risk score that we built specifically for PAD, you get some improvement in the model metrics as well. So this was all done using um, big retrospective data sets. And so the idea is how do we pull what we're doing um, on the computer into clinical practice. And I thought, uh, and oh yeah, sorry, our, the models have good calibration as well. So if we're looking at pulling it into clinical practice, like Nigam um, had mentioned earlier, there's differences in the science, the practice and delivery, right? So this is um, maybe since we have some genetic data at Stanford and we have this phenomenal EHR resource, maybe we can combine these things so that I, as a clinician interested in patients with PAD can build um, models models that can leverage these two data sets, which will allow me to improve my detection of patients with PAD and maybe one day do it before they're diagnosed so we can get even earlier on the bandwagon to treat them. 
So this first started with building a cohort. Um, and this was um, just very manual chart review, but in a great um, representation, like using this um, GUI um, to review patients' charts is way better than like logging into Epic and doing this manually. So um, the first goal was to identify a cohort of patients with and without PAD of about similar ages. Um, and then we restricted um, the patient search to those who were within the Precision Health Biobank, which was a feature that was added a few years ago and was super helpful. Um, and in the end, um, we have about, um, or started out with about 288 patients, of which there are only 54 cases of PAD. Some of that was um, some of the samples from the Precision Health Biobank hadn't made it on to um, the cohort discovery tool yet. Plus, I had very strict um, criteria to ensure that the people we were selecting as cases truly had PAD. Um, and so in gathering and pre-processing the data, the EHR data came from STAR OMOP, um, which many of you have experience with. And then the genetic data, which I thought was just gonna come in um, a nice little table, actually needed to be processed. Um, and so we worked with the Thermo Fisher Lab um, to uh, run samples through their precision medicine array. Um, and the data analysis was done on Google Cloud um, through STAR OMOP. The EHR data was really collapsed into 10 features um, that uh, improve our um, ability to detect risk of peripheral artery disease. And then we use the Sherlock cluster to do our uh, geno, uh, genotype, uh, like the analysis of the genetic data. Um, and we had um, over 800,000 SNPs from our um, manual processing through Thermo Fisher, but then imputed like 17 million more. And so the building the models, um, really standard stuff in terms of, you know, 70-30 splits and cross-validation to um, refine the model um, prediction abilities. Um, and then we had one held out test set that we did a few things with. One was to um, evaluate the performance of a model built on clinical features alone, on genetic features alone, and then to combine them in quote unquote fusion, which was to take the predictions from each and then um, run a logistic regression model to see what the final prediction was and evaluate all of these on the um, same held out test set just for a comparison. Um, so in the end, um, after um, quality control, um, uh, yeah, running through quality control, we had to drop about 10 patients, two of which uh, were PAD patients. Um, we looked at the polygenic risk score, which takes all of the uh, genome and summarizes your genetic risk of PAD, and then looked at just a few high risk SNPs, um, which were of which there were 42. Um, again, the premise behind this is if I, um, as someone who wants to implement this, can do, do so by only genotyping a few um, parts of a patient's genome. Um, you know, uh, DNA, that's probably much better and easier than running through their whole genome. And so looking at um, the a very basic model, um, just a logistic regression for PAD um, using age, sex, and uh, ethnicity, um, we find that, you know, the model performs um, okay. Um, just knowing a person's age, gender, and ethnicity, you find out um, some information about their risk of PAD. Um, and then when we add a polygenic risk score, there is some improvement um, in their the model performance. So then um, again, uh, looking at um, the models broken down one by one, um, looking at clinical risk factors for which there are about 10 features, um, we find that the model um, has um, is pretty good at discriminating people at high, a higher low risk of having PAD, although the calibration, especially in the um, intermediate risk, um, needs a bit of work, although it is a small sample size. When we look at the genetic factors alone, and this is a model built on just the 42 SNPs, uh, controlling for age, gender, and uh, race ethnicity, um, we find that the model performs just as well as um, the uh, model using the entire genome. So already you, you, we can kind of um, take a little bit from this to say that we might not need to know everything about a patient's DNA to um, detect their risk of PAD. And then when we combine the genetics um, and the clinical features, we see that the AUC does improve, um, although calibration is a bit off um, in a different way and will require more, more data, more modeling, et cetera. 
So the takeaways um, I found through all of this experience is that RIT has built, and I will say RIC as well, has built um, phenomenal tools for young labs to get off the ground and um, explore different areas of research. Uh, STAR enables countless ways to integrate multiple types of data. Um, although I did <laughs> learn that like you should understand the difference between like on-prem versus cloud environments and how to optimize um, research in a cloud um, compute uh, environment and understanding the unique data um, acquisition and processing um, that you'll need to do to get some of your um, research off the ground. Um, and specifically for this study, um, the, the idea really as a clinician is to understand like what is it that a new type of data is going to give us, um, the, in this case genetic data, is it going to help improve the timing of diagnosis, um, provide pre better prognostication, and what is its ultimate utility? And so with that, I say thank you all for your time. Thank you, Elsie. That was great. Um, and I, if I could request you to just wait, uh, because I think what I'm noticing is questions are trickling in on the Q&A a few minutes after. So uh, if you don't mind monitoring that. Yeah, happy uh, to answer that. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Next speaker is Min Mugen, who's a graduate student uh, at the Department of Biomedical Informatics and affiliated with uh, Michael uh, Biochi's lab. Um, Min, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, so my name is Min Nguyen. I'm a four-year PhD student in the Biomedical Informatics program. Today, I'm gonna briefly mention the projects that I use star data um, in the context of emergency triage uh, machine learnings for risk prediction with human in the loop. I can move the slide. Let me see. Okay. Um, so EHR data really offer a tremendous opportunity for machine learning research. And um, the one of the uh, common applications in for machine learning in emergency medicine is prediction hospital admissions. Uh, however, it's not so much for predicting ICU care need uh, among admitted uh, ED patients. Um, so our first project, we focus on developing machine learning models for uh, triage uh, patients for hospital admission. Um, and our project that sort of expanded from that um, looked at a broader implication of uh, machine learning modeling, um, still use an example in the context of uh, emergency triage. We looked at questions, focus on questions like, is prediction really needed when it should be done? And how do you interpret the output from the risk prediction models um, and all, all within, um, all considering having a human in the loops to gain insight uh, for better model development. Um, so in terms of problem formulation, I'll talk more of uh, the data aspects uh, with star data. So we use EHR star data from January 20, 2015 to uh, March 2020 originally. And the reason why we picked 2015 is that uh, when we were looking at the data, we noticed that the um, hospital units at Stanford, the acuity level was changed sometime in 2014 from a numerical um, number to like from one to 14 to um, a more of a system with acute, intermediate and ICU um, with a critical care units. And we couldn't map um, the previous you know, numerical system to the current one. So we ended up using the data from 2015 onward uh, for consistency in terms of uh, unit security level at the Stanford Hospital. Um, in terms of problem framing, uh, let's take T0 as a time when the physician, the ED physician write an admission order for a patient to be admitted to a hospital unit. Um, and then 24, we also looked at the 24 hours later after that, given that the ED environment is a very high stake um, uh, environment. So we consider the initial decision might not reflect um, what the patient's care need is uh, supposed to be at uh, the admission time. Um, so let's say, for example, if I come in and the physician uh, admit me to an acute unit, my label at T0 would be zero. Um, and then maybe, 18 hours later, I get transferred to an ICU and stay there until the 24 hours. Then my label at the 
the window prediction window T24 would be uh, one for being in an ICU. So there is a change for, um, for that uh, individual person. So we use the same, however, we use the same features, uh, no notes, um, there's, uh, I'll mention this later, collected all prior to the, the initial admission decision. And we also use the same prediction algorithm. So our model is technically different in only in the outcome temporally. Um, so briefly in terms of prediction results at time zero and time 24, um, in terms of evaluation metrics commonly as uh, the area under the rock curve or the area under the precision recall, um, prediction at time zero uh, has much better performance, let's say for 0.91 AURC versus 0.85. And then um, 0.64 for a precision recall curve uh, versus 0.50. However, if you look at the calibration plus, the prediction at time 24 actually seems a little bit better. Um, but the uh, what we want to focus on in the second project was that we have two different models as we uh, as I described before, with the same features, uh, the same algorithm, but with two uh, with outcome at two different time. So the model really provide a contrasting uh, machine learning risk prediction temporal, temporally. And our task was to explore why there's just a discordant in predicted risk at two different time point. Um, is that, does that make sense? Or is that something we can improve from model development? Um, so we basically propose a thick analytics framework. And in the interest of time, I will not go into the detail of this. Um, but the main thing to, that we did was to look at the two different predicted risks from two different time point and look at the discordant of the, the same, uh, the, a, pair, a pair of predicted risks for the same admission and selected cases for expert evaluation. Um, that means we do a lot of uh, reading of the actual patient medical record. And we actually also scan through um, the whole data, um, star data available in our version to look for uh, more information and apply the general framework that we propose um, for the problem. The goal is really to generate insight and suggestion to improve model development. So here's a brief uh, diagram of our process uh, with start at the explore of the data and exploratory data analysis and end with a validation data set. So in terms of validation, we actually uh, got new data from April 2020 to September 2021, um, which was not used in the original uh, model development. And um, so the, the key outcome that we got out of the process is that we can think about redefining our cohort to see whether or not some patient in certain group are not appropriate for uh, to, to be included in the prediction model. Maybe they should be a separate subgroup uh, and maybe they're not even uh, appropriate for prediction. Um, we talk about uh, features, new features that we can add um, for structure data, information that we got out of the nodes that are not easily available in structure data can probably be considered in future development um, of EPIC, um, or query the data to get them more in an easier, as more accessible format for future research. And then in terms of outcome, maybe instead of looking at only the two prediction time, T0 and T24, we might wanna look at other time point de depending on uh, what's the goal of the prediction. Um, we actually encounter a challenge in now star data version that we use that there wasn't any notes available, only the timestamp of the notes. Um, so we couldn't really do a lot of um, like algorithm work in terms of notes, but we have to use uh, the actual note in the EHR. But I'm aware that the star uh, also have a version where the notes are available. Um, so just a quick example of what I meant by uh, choosing different uh, prediction time window is that I, we only do T0 and T24. And in hindsight, this seems obvious. Why didn't we look at this from the beginning, right? But it took a year and a half for us to get to this point. Um, if I look at the um, transfer direction for in and out the ICU, I see there's a very specific pattern at different time, like say, for example, time six 
the six hour, the nine hour, the 12 hours, it, um, it indicates different phenomenon in terms of patient being transferred in and out of the ICU. Um, validation result, this table has a lot of information here, but the main takeaway is that our original data actually work, still work really well in the new test set that we didn't use before. Um, and the new data with the model development that we incorporate all the insight from our thick analytic process um, using the new data set and uh, we actually improve the model even further with very little changes that we could make given that we didn't have the nodes to do any algorithm make work there. Um, so discussion really, um, we kind of want to emphasize the importance of integrate human domain knowledge to improve model development. And also model development should not be a one-time um, develop you know, model for any task, but it should be an iterative task to refine and improve the, uh, the process of modeling. Um, Besides suggesting, you know, development and data collection for future research and redefining problem framing, the goal is still towards a more actionable, safe and trustworthy model where we can consider like actually de deploying the model uh, for, for useful use in the uh, hospital setting instead of just developing a model for the sake of developing models. Uh, the main challenge of this project is really focusing on human resource. Do we have enough um, people who have both clinical and machine learning knowledge to do to apply the framework? Uh, or do we have a team that have people from different backgrounds and work can work really, really well together? And with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, people that I work with on this project, the grant that I'm on, the fundings, and um, the data and services provided by STAR, especially the GCP credit that was given to me that was super, super uh, helpful and motivating. Thank you. Thank you, Min. Uh, that was great. I'm just curious to know why you had, was there an issue with getting notes or? I was using um, one of the version from John's lab for a while and I kind of just get used to it. And when I get to the idea of doing the, the notes project and I realized that we didn't actually have it. Yeah. Um, and at that point, it seems like it's too far in the process. And uh, okay, yeah. So. Yes, so we have star OMOP DID light, which, is, which doesn't contain any unstructured data. So it does not contain the notes, it does not contain the note annotations. Um, and then there's star OMOP DID, which is everything. So it does, that one does contain the clinical notes and the de-identified versions of both are available. It's just that one is a much bigger data set than the other. So depending on what you're trying to do, you may choose to use one or the other. I see, just, yeah. Just to, just to uh, keep your costs. Yeah, uh, thank you. Better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's move on to our uh, next speaker. Uh, sorry, Mid, if you can also just keep, um, you know, watching the Q&A channel. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Evan uh, Minty. Evan is a general internist at the O'Brien School for Public Health at the University of Calgary. Um, he's also an alum of the Department of Biomedical Informatics, and he's affiliated with the Shaw Lab. Evan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes, we are. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Priya, so much for inviting me. Uh, for those I haven't interacted with there, I'm, um, as Priya mentioned, I'm, a, I'm alumni of the Stanford BMI program. Uh, I'm a general internist and I practice clinically in, in Calgary and I'm one of the clinical informatics uh, physicians there. And with the research time I'm lucky enough to have, I, I, I get to invest it with um, Shaw Lab where I've been pursuing work within the Odyssey network. And just let me know if this advances here. Um, and what, what Priya suggested is that I offer a talk on what motivates my interest in participating in um, the uh, Odyssey Network or Observational Health and Data Sciences and Informatics, um, which I pre presume may be a, a new entity or maybe a known entity to most of you on this call, but um, maybe new to, to some, some who are, are newly joining um, and discuss the progress and challenges in implementing Odyssey network studies. Uh, this is a figure that was an influential one for me, appearing at a, at a 
pivotal time when I was finishing my internal medicine fellowship. Um, and it's drawn from an Institute of Medicine report uh, that was a sort of a desiderata for a learning health system. And that report's actually nearing its 10 year anniversary. Uh, it illustrates the missed opportunities, waste, and uh, potential harm in the translation of science to our evidence base, um, and then from that evidence base to the point of care for application, and from point of care to data capture to uh, capture the, the patient experience. And I always looked at this figure as an indictment of our health systems, because it would take almost as granted that the evidence base is reliable um, if only those systems could be configured to better use it. Uh, but if I title this slide differently, I, I think it's actually an app descriptor of a system for generating evidence, creating waste and harm. Uh, in fact, I'd argue that our observational health evidence generation system is structurally more stuck than the health systems that are poised to consume the evidence. And so we can take that learning health system formulation to consider our, our evidence generation process in more detail. And it takes the following general steps um, in moving from uh, patient experience, that patient experience is captured in data. We then select a set of methods to, to analyze the data drawn from different fields and data analysis. Um, the data is then reconfigured into an appropriate shape and state uh, so, that day, so that it can act as an operand for um, that set of methods. And each step is met with obstacles that need to be overcome, taking steps that are generally unique, uh, resulting in the production of a manuscript that can only really ever serve as a um, poorly or low fidelity specification of the steps that were taken. And that's something that I know Kristen, Adam, and Asia will be exploring with many of you in um, one of the forthcoming workshops. And of course, there's a large number of these systems operating in parallel. Uh, the, sh the data shape for each is slightly different, and that data is inherently sensitive, so sharing is close to impossible. And consequently, the data and methods um, are hard to share, and the they almost become assets within each silo. Uh, and the path taken from the barrier through the methods to the evidence is um, almost certainly unique in each. Uh, and the only real communication between them is in the production of those low fidelity specifications. Um, and the incentive structure is such that these systems are in a degree of competition um, where the production of those specifications is kind of a key metric. Um, and so some degree of this is healthy and necessary, a, a balance between exploration and exploitation, but at the same time, it feels like our evidence generation system, at least as it can pertain to the academic production of observational evidence um, in the traditional sense, can feel stuck in this cycle. Um, and I'll note that, you know, even though it's a discussion for another day, that the incentives for this evidence production kind of stop short of um, implementation, evaluation, and maintenance at the bedside at point of care, as, as Nigan kind of alluded to earlier. Um, and that turning of that those cycles results in dots on this figure and I don't know if it's one that's um, you know widely known within uh, within Stanford circles it's a study that was um, completed by Martin Shumi and others within the the Odyssey network and part of the study looked at doing an NLP analysis of existing observational health literature processing the abstracts of over a hundred thousand kind of more traditional observational health studies you know case control studies uh, self-controlled case series cohort method studies, et cetera. And from those abstracts, the effect size, p-value, and confidence interval were extracted and standardized to give the standard error on the y-axis. Um, and the x-axis there is, the, is effect size. And on the left, it, that plot shows um, the distribution of those effect estimates across the entirety of the observational literature that they, that they extracted. And what it shows that is that over 80% of the literature shows evidence of effect. Um, and in subsequent simulation studies, you can demonstrate that even with perfect knowledge of the effect size that you were looking for, the perfect, not perfect priors, you would not get a distribution that looks like this, um, especially with that sharp boundary and density at the, at the red line. And the red line there is um, a p-value of 0 0.05. Uh, and so the only real explanation here is publication bias. Um, there's a tendency to only port significant results, but uh, there's also a lack of transparency and dissemination and a clear, at the very least, incentive for, for p-hacking. Uh, the plot on the right shows the same analysis, but for depression treatments. Um, and so the broader pattern repeats itself, but the other message to draw from this plot is that within any particular therapeutic area, the result space is also sparse. And so a figure like, the, like this kind of consider, or suggests that um, when you consider it writ large, we are incenting the high volume production, but not high volume enough, 
of observational estimates in a system that um, generates those estimates that are either poorly calibrated um, or have demonstrable bias, uh, or at the very least offer a, a non-systematic coverage of a domain. And so my involvement in Odyssey didn't start with that plot, but with the promise of uh, a more systematic and transparent approach to observational data science. Uh, Odyssey is an open science multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder community driving the development of open data standards, open source analysis software, and open science best practices within regulators, academia, industry, payers, and health systems. Um, and uh, it, I really would credit my exposure to some of these concepts at Stanford for, for my interest in Odyssey. Um, in particular, the systematic transparent approach the observational health data science had to start with an open data standard to provide our scaffold for methods advancement. Um, and this was an arc that I had seen in BMI that had been traveled by other domains. Uh, and so I, you know, on this slide, I kind of offer a parallel here to other ones that I encountered in that training, particularly with bioinformatics and how the development of common data standards there, um, for, ex for example, to specify the results of a microarray, a microarray experiment led to a fluent science analysis community that has yielded methods and insights into the you know, ver various features of the statistics of those data sets. Um, and that's allowed us to generate uh, evidence from a domain that was otherwise previously plagued by, by false positive results. And I, I see something very similar over time as, a, as I've been involved there happening within the observational health data science community. Um, and there's no doubt that I think a, a, an impressive um, uh, method value chain is being created uh, both in terms of the methods themselves, but also the insights that spill over from their application to observational health data sets. And the figure at the top right um, demonstrates the re reproduction of an, an effect estimate that was drawn from the literature, that yellow triangle there, that was a self-controlled case series. And in that, both the literature example from which it was drawn and in this experiment, it suggested a positive association between sertraline and GI bleeding. And what their work suggested was that in this context, um, that uh, positive effect size or, uh, estimate sits in the middle of a uh, distribution of other effect estimates um, th that uh, were presumed to be negative control. So all those purple dots are dots um, of exposures that were not expected to show an association with GI bleeding. Other medications, et cetera, you know, that, uh, that weren't thought to um, be correlated. Uh, and what you can see there is that that effect size sits basically in the middle of what is an empirically determined null distribution um, against which they suggest that in certain contexts, we should be calibrating our uh, effect estimates uh, against a, a, a calibrated p-value. So the nominal p-value would be the one shown by that dashed line. The calibrated p-value area, area, area of significance for the calibrated p-value is shown in the shaded areas. And I'm just kind of showing here, kind of indicating the packages within the open source um, health analytics data evidence suite that are um, implied in, in, um, in performing those, uh, those adjustments. Um, they have kind of cer certain dependencies that we wouldn't want to build ourselves in terms of, you know, highly efficient um, algorithms uh, or, or a package for highly efficient uh, implementation of propensity score matching. Then also, of course, um, the packages that allow you to, to apply the analysis to a network of, uh, network of databases. Um, and so uh, that really has kind of prompted my interest in, in continuing work with that network. And the culmination of these efforts really is to produce um, calibrated evidence across a domain at scale. And this is at the heart of Odyssey's legend studies or large scale evidence generation and evaluation and network of databases. And the plots here show the evidence or show, show the results of the legend hypertension study. And on the left, you see kind of a necessarily sparse graph that shows the head-to-head -head comparisons that have been completed within hypertension agents in randomized clinical trials. Um, and on the right, on the kind of you know, middle portion or the right side of that first figure, you see the head-to-head -head comparisons that were generated in the legend hypertension study, each one um, a propensity match cohort method study uh, that with, uh, with effect sizes that were um, calibrated to the empirically determined, determined null distributions. Um, and that produces or kind of restores what we what we might expect in terms of a um, systematic uh, um, evidence base within a particular domain. And uh, one one of the studies that I'm currently working on is uh, at, at executing within Stanford Data is the application of the Legend Framework to um, uh, looking at second line treatment in diabetes. 
uh, and there's a few others I, I'm, I'm working on looking at NLP, for instance, in um, COVID, or COVID uh, uh, patients looking for um, evidence of, of proning. Uh, but the, the one I'll kind of explore a little bit more in detail is the um, lessons on the, uh, uh, on, on the attempts to, 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 to run some of these network studies against Stanford data. Um, and so uh, the application of open science against observational health data can be measured not only against a result uh, about, against the ability to produce a result set at scale, but also some weighty principles and, and lofty aspirations um, that include a couple of Stanford scientists. And so uh, David Donahoe, a Stanford-based statistician, offered a reasonable working definition of scholarship in open science in that the scholarship is the full, full software environment, code, and data that produce a result. Uh, and John Clairbout is a geophysicist from Stanford who's widely credited as being one of the, one of the first to make um, strong appeals for open reproducible research, um, provided a working definition of reproducibility. Uh, judgment of reproducibility no longer requires an expert. A clerk can do it, to which an observational health correlate might be no longer requires an expert. An MD can do it. And so um, those are the aspirations against, uh, against which this started. And uh, here is how it's going. So I think um, I think we'd all acknowledge in working with observational health data that uh, in moving from patient experience to data in in a common data model, um, that uh, we certainly have to make certain modeling assumptions. Those modeling assumptions aren't going to be identical from site to site. Um, but I think there's active work in the community to try to understand, you know, a, a set of metadata that might be able to be shared that allows. Um, allows us to kind of infer the appropriate for use or appropriateness of use for use for um, a different you know a site in the network for a particular study question. Um, one area that I think holds considerable promise is combining what Odyssey is using for study environment management um, in RM with uh, containerization to achieve something close to Donahoe's original vision. And a great deal of credit here to Jose Posada for helping to um, advance this vision within the Odyssey community. And I know Adam Black and others are at Odysseus have been um, instrumental in both advocating for it and helping to bring, its, uh, bring it to fruition at Stanford. Um, in terms of uh, actual implementation, uh, I think others who, who've been trying to run network studies um, can probably share some, some similar stories around some struggles with BigQuery syntax that generally are, are uh, resolved with strict adherence to um, some of the packages that translate SQL within Odyssey, um, although the incentives for, for, for writing code in that way aren't always present um, more widely in the community. Uh, I think there's been you know, some uh, methods and security issues that, uh, um, or some security issues that we managed to address by creating Stanford specific branches of, you know, for instance, one of the Hades packages, cohort diagnostics, and that's allowed us to run um, some of the characterization network studies uh, successfully. Um, and then uh, other system dependencies uh, like R Java and, and to different kind of system libraries um, that uh, with Jose's help, we've developed containerized solutions for, and that uh, uh, creates, um, hopefully it means that we only pay that freight once and those uh, containers can be used by others who wanna run uh, Odyssey network studies. And then finally, um, uh, issues with quotas within BigQuery that kind of reflect a us using BigQuery in, in ways that it might not have originally been intended um, as, 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 as a transactional database. Um, and those have, we've been working through by uh, just creating some specific Stanford branch runaround uh, workarounds. And so while not without challenges, I think the overall process still achieves much in the way of transparency and reproducibility. Um, and as much as the methods used to overcome those obstacles are, are, are captured in public repositories and still hues much closer to um, an ultimate goal of reproducible network research uh, than uh, our current system for generating evidence. And so overall concluding points um, is that our, our, in our traditional observational evidence generation systems are, are somewhat stuck um, and can be producing evidence in a manner that's demonstrably biased, not systematic or transparent or reproducible, um, that open data standards play an essential role in enabling uh, open data analytics and open science. And, and that's what really prompts my interest in Odyssey. And I really hope that we would see, uh, that we'll see more people from Stanford joining the community to, to help advance this uh, together as a, um, as a wider uh, scientific community. Um, and it spills over to advancing the science that can be assumed and delivered at the bedside, even through um, uh, organizations like Atropoth that I know um, 
consume a lot of the the, the methodology advancements that that um, are produced uh, in Odyssey, uh, and that the path to reliable evidence via open science will still have um, bumps in the road. And that's it. Happy to address any questions. Thank you very much to uh, Nigam, the rest of the Shaw Lab uh, members within, and and Priya and the team at um, BMI R and D. Uh, thank you, Evan. Uh, yes. Uh, I, um, you know, kudos to you for sticking with us. I know it's been a bumpy road, uh, but um, I, I guess, you know, for all pioneers, it's a bumpy road. So, you know, we will get through it. Oh, and, uh, there is a question for you. Um, it's, can you speak more to the observational studies and challenges around depression? Uh, and uh, she's referring to your slide. How does the Open Data Science uh, Group how does the open data science group, I guess, help? Uh, can you send a link to the organization? So it's in the Q and A. So you can feel free to, uh, you know, send the link there. But if you can just talk to that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it, it, was, it was it was less about just depression specifically, and and more the fact that if you I think if you looked at any particular domain area, um, whether that was hypertension or depression, you would see that you know there's certainly lots of questions, um, lots of comparisons that haven't been drawn and it, that the evidence could be explored in a more systematic and calibrated way. Um, and so really it wasn't necessarily about th that therapeutic area in particular, um, but about uh, um, a lack of uh, our ability to take systematic approaches to generate evidence um, within within the, the paradigm that, that we were relying on previously. Um, and only to kind of address your comment uh, there, Priya, I hope, you know, that wasn't intended as a, as a criticism at all. Actually, it hasn't dampened my enthusiasm. Oh even no, it. no. I, uh, I, I've uh, you know yeah. every, every bump in the road is actually a new challenge, and I really enjoy yeah, it. Absolutely, I, and that's how I look at it too, right? Like we haven't done this before, so yeah, it's not going to be a bed of roses, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our next speaker is uh, Juan Manuel Chavez. Uh, Juan is a graduate student at the Department of Biomedical Informatics, and he's affiliated with the Akshay Chaudhary's lab. Thanks, Priya. Let me just share my screen. Right, and you should be able to see my slides, hopefully. Um, so I'll be talking about a um, specific project focused on automatic body CT protocoling. Um, and in order to do that, um, I'll first start off by introducing kind of what is the general steps of the radiology workflow, uh, where an exam order is typically uh, generated by a non-radiologist clinician um, that in that order uh, aims to address a specific clinical question. So uh, in the body CT world, a uh, common question is, does my patient have appendicitis? Um, this order is then converted to a specific protocol by either a radiologist or a radiology technologist. It's scheduled, it's adapted to a specific device, uh, and that is the machine protocol down here. Um, and then the image is acquired, uh, there's some pre-processing uh, and post-processing done, and finally it's interpreted by a radiologist, resulting in the generation of a report. Uh, which is then shared uh, back to the original clinician. Um, so the majority of current AI in radiology research has focused on, on this latter uh, part of the workflow, but our project is actually uh, focused on the earlier part, which is how do we go from this uh, initial clinical question and exam order um, into generating a specific machine level protocol? Um, and definitely uh, getting this data in itself uh, is, is pretty challenging. And so uh, STAR has played a key role in, in not only allowing us to observe, um, you know, the typical covariates of a patient's EHR, but uh, getting this detailed uh, information from the uh, radiology informatics system. Um, and so um, definitely thank you um, to the folks at STAR and RIC uh, and RIT for um, helping us obtain this data set. Um, and why do we want to do this? Uh, essentially, protocoling is highly repetitive, and it requires manual input every time. So right now, uh, radiology fellows will sit down at the end of their day uh, for one to one and a half hours and just select uh, the appropriate protocol based on what the clinician's orders are. Um, and additionally, protocoling mistakes often require rescheduling of patient and or uh, 
potential additional imaging. Uh, some est estimates are um, that up to 50% of patients can be receiving incorrect uh, components in their imaging uh, that are not supported by current American College of Radiology criteria. So uh, briefly, this is what an exam order can look like. Um, and as you can see, it's a mixture of different data types. Um, and uh, these are kind of the relevant data types that we have uh, in order to, uh, to get our uh, specific protocol uh, selected. So here is a, an example of a, a patient who uh, acute abdominal pain um, who has a history of appendectomy. Uh, and then um, here are their demographics. Um, and now our overall goal is to go from this exam order to the specific protocol. Um, and in order to do so, we need to select some sort of representation for this uh, data. And I won't go too much into detail into uh, the specific representation here. Um, and then we need to go and uh, use this representation in a given model and finally select the uh, correct exam protocol. Um, so one approach uh, we, could, we, we took was, um, how about we, we try to predict uh, the radiology protocol directly? And so here's the mo most common uh, radiology protocols. Um, and as you can see, the majority of protocols are within a, a limited subset. Um, and there's kind of a long tail to the distribution, uh, which is kind of what you'd expect. So we found there in, in our data set, there were over 100 different body CT protocols. Um, out of the overall about 2,000 protocols that are available at Stanford radiology in, in imaging overall. Um, but the majority of them are you know, occurring within um, about 80% here, we can see, are probably around within the top 10. So, um, so one modeling approach we took was, uh, let's take our, uh, all our information from the um, radiology order, encode it somehow, um, and use a classifier to try to predict what the uh, correct uh, one out of um, you know, 25 or 78 or 99, whatever number of protocols we want to use, um, and kind of produce this ranked list of protocols. And so we can see uh, whether we are getting the answer correctly as our first choice prediction, or whether, for example, it's in the top three um, predictions. So that could... Uh, by, by being a little bit flexible, we can, we can suggest protocols. Um, and so hopefully the, the clinician can um, select the correct protocol, um, you know, just from an abbreviated list of options. Uh, and so when we, we looked at that, we found out that um, our performance with uh, only looking at the top 10 protocols was about 65% for getting the correct answer right in, as our number one choice. Um, and that uh, increased um, as we as we uh, become a little bit more flexible in the in the ranking of our uh, correct choice, um, but we see a decrease in performance as we include more and more of this longer tail, um, and so we decided to take a different approach. And instead of having one classifier for, for example, twenty five classes, uh, we uh, focus on having four classifiers that um, each independently try to predict different part of the protocol. So uh, for example, looking at the anatomy, should this, uh, the anatomy that's imaged be abdomen, pelvis, abdomen and pelvis, um, chest, abdomen and pelvis, or uh, something else? Uh, is there a specific organ that the image um, uh, should be focusing on? Is, should there be use of IV contrast or positive oral contrast? Um, and what this allows us is not only to, um, generate more specialized classifiers, but uh, this actually will be very useful in trying to adapt to different institutions where the protocols uh, might have slightly different names or uh, will potentially vary slightly. So uh, this is a nice intermediate um, step. And what we found is that um, we, we can actually do pretty well in predicting uh, the different protocols, um, which is great. So um, um, the, the one limitation is uh, maybe here, this positive oral contrast classifier, which we're still working on improving, although it's arguably a more uh, subjective decision whether you decide to use this or not. Um, so this is great, but um, how do we go from, you know, 97% accuracy roughly to actually selecting the correct protocol? Um, and if you look at, for example, a confusion uh, table, um, ideally you want to be somewhere on this diagonal, 
Um, but how do you know where, when you're in the diagonal versus you're, you're fairly, um, for example, confident, but maybe you're making a wrong prediction um, or uh, you're not super confident and, and you, want to, you want the classifier to be able to um, output um, not only some sort of confidence, but maybe abstain from making a prediction. And so in order to do so, um, we decided to uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that our classifier is uh, calibrated uh, and use the predicted probability for a class to select a threshold at which, which we will make the predictions. So um, in doing so, uh, for example, for the region classifier, um, this anatomy classifier, we can predict 91% uh, of all protocols uh, with uh, over 98% 98 per, 98 accuracy. Uh, and similarly, uh, for the anatomy, we can do 96% uh, of the protocols that are coming in. Um, so this allows really radiologists to uh, free up their time, um, look at the remainder, uh, maybe 10% or 5% of protocols that uh, need uh, their attention. Um, and it's actually a, a great win for everyone. Um, we're actually working on um, uh, setting up a silent deployment to see how, how this model is going to uh, perform, um, quote unquote, in the wild. Um, and we're very excited to also expand uh, from body CT, which was an initial approach that we decided to take to the overall larger subset of 2000 images. Um, so those are, are some exciting next steps for us. Um, and then finally, I'd like to conclude uh, thanking uh, the team that uh, helped make this possible, including um, Akshay Chadari and Daniel Rubin, who are my advisors, um, and also GE Healthcare for sponsoring this pro project. And of course, uh, the SAR team for not only providing data, but allowing me the opportunity to present today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, I know, so we are on to our last speaker for the morning session. Uh, but I just had a quick announcement uh, to make uh, before, uh, you know, after lunch, would you guys, those of you who are coming back, uh, you know, to participate in any of the workshops, this is a webinar right now. It will have been converted into a Zoom meeting and you will see clearly labeled breakout rooms. Uh, please, you feel free, you should be able to go join the breakout room, you know, the, join the main breakout room for whatever workshop it is um, that was your first choice. So, um, but with that, let's, uh, let's go to Bezad. Bezad is a postdoc at the Department of Biomedical Informatics, uh, and he is affiliated with uh, Tina Bussard's lab. Bezad, all yours. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Priya. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank Priya for having me here and so provide this opportunity to share our research and our experience on uh, StarMod data. Uh, my name is Behzad Nader al Wujud, and at the moment I'm working on uh, as a postdoctoral research fellow in biomedical informatic research at the Bostrock lab. Uh, two days I'm going to uh, discuss uh, about our research uh, on proline opioid use and uh, post-surgical uh, pain outcomes. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to talk about a research talk and go to the details. And I would like to show you how we can, uh, how we have used uh, the STAR OMOP and the RDC tools uh, in our research. Uh, so Rikel on the project, uh, uh, actually, this project is a part of the NLM project uh, under the supervision of the Dr. Tina hernandez Bossart. And so uh, in this part of the project, I'm using uh, on predictive models in order to uh, predict the post-operative pain outcomes uh, using all of CDM. Uh, the objective of my project here uh, actually is to develop clinical phenotypes uh, using star OMOP and then uh, develop uh, post-operative uh, pain risk stratification model for 
three outcomes, uh, prolonged opioid use, readmission, and pain readmission. Uh, and finally, our objective is to uh, conduct uh, external validation on the RDC community. If you uh, if look at our study design and uh, here uh, uh, our objective is to provide a research study with an external validation conducted the RDC community uh, that provides a transparency, reproducibility and the fairness. And so uh, this is the advantage of the start um, of that we can uh, that we will be able to use the RDC tools and uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan uh, discussed the different uh, uh, analysis uh, packages that uh, we have in the Odyssey uh, community, and uh, all of these uh, packages can be used if we you, if you use the STAR OMOP. And also, uh, we can use the Stanford Atlas and the Atlas instances uh, to conduct our research. Uh, today, I will uh, focus on the cohort uh, definition, cohort characterization, and the risk analysis and prediction models. Uh, using the Atlas, and I will show you how we uh, how we have used uh, the Odyssey tools and the, the Odyssey packages, the Hades packages, for example, uh, for conducting our research. Uh, in the core study, uh, here we can see uh, our cohort definition rules, and so uh, the first uh, our first target cohort is uh, uh, related to patients who underwent one of the surgery in CBT and ICD codes uh, that we have already defined uh, based on the specific uh, codes. And so all of these, uh, we have translated all of these rules in, uh, in the Atlas cohort definition module. And so uh, as you can see here, we have uh, eight, uh, uh, actually eight rules. And so uh, in order to define the cohorts in Atlas, we have used uh, different uh, uh, different concept sets and so for drugs, for example, for in order to define our opioid drugs, we have used nine uh, drug ingredients and we have used 18 uh, main uh, surgeries in order to define uh, the surgery concepts. Here you can see the output of the Atlas for uh, after running uh, our cohorts. And uh, this is an example of uh, the Atlas out, uh, output for uh, uh, the cohort definition. And as you can see, uh, in this, uh, in the attrition visualization, you can see how, uh, uh, including uh, each of the inclusion criteria, uh, reduce the patient numbers. And as a result, we have uh, uh, 65,000 patients uh, in our target cohorts. And uh, in this research, our outcome cohort is the opioid drug exposure between uh, three and six months after the surgery. And uh, as an uh, intersection of uh, between the target and outcomes result uh, incidence rate of 15 person. And so our objective is to uh, characterize uh, the prolonged opioid user uh, in our cohorts and predict uh, this, uh, the prolonged opioid users at this specific time at risk. Uh, after the cohort characterization and after defining the, uh, the cohorts and our target cohorts and outcome cohorts, uh, uh, we have applied the cohort characterization. And here you can see uh, the output of the cohort characterization that we have done uh, on the Atlas. And uh, in the cohort characterization of the Atlas, uh, you will be able to uh, define your own uh, features, or you can use, uh, for example, uh, predefined features. For example, the demographic features have already been defined, and you can use, for example, the demographic feature, gender, race, ethnicity, and age groups. Uh, for example, in our research, we have defined a new features, uh, prevalence features here, and you can see uh, the distribution of uh, the specific cancer uh, diagnosis codes. Uh, you know, we have defined some, uh, actually we are interested on some specific cancers, and so we have defined our features based on uh, the cancer diagnosis codes. And uh, here you can see the distribution of these cancers in two populations, for example, uh, uh, the prolonged opioid users and not prolonged opioid users. And so you will be able to define, for example, uh, distributional features, for example, for, uh, for the previous feature, uh, we have defined another uh, distributional features and you can see uh, which kind of cancers uh, can be, uh, have impact uh, uh, on our cohorts. For example, you can see the distribution of different kinds of cancer in not prolonged opioid users and prolonged opioid users here. 
and also you can uh, you can use, for example, uh, the predefined uh, features on the atlas, condition features, and the procedure features. And this is the output of uh, the characterization of the atlas. And so. Uh, for uh, for the second readmission outcome, we have defined uh, auto target cohorts. Actually, uh, this cohort is the same as the previous one. Only uh, we didn't consider the opioid use around the surgery, and so this cohort, uh, in order to evaluate the readmission outcome, we only considered a general uh, uh, surgery cohorts. And here again, you can see the uh, graphical view of the atlas uh, when you want to uh, define uh, your own cohorts. And so this is uh, uh, the graphical view of our uh, defined cohorts. And so again, you can see the results. And in this cohort, we have uh, only uh, five uh, criteria. And so again, as a result of this cohort, we have achieved uh, 44,000 patients uh, with, uh, with specific uh, surgeries. And here our outcomes is 30-day uh, readmission and 30-day pain readmission. Uh, for this cohort, we have applied a risk analysis uh, in, the, uh, in the ATLAS. Here you can see, for example, uh, you, you can define some subgroups. Uh, for example, you can uh, evaluate uh, the risk rate uh, with respect to different populations, for example, in male, uh, female, diabetes, depression, and uh, obesity, uh, obese, and also the combination of you. In, in, the, in the right, uh, on the right uh, diagram, you can see uh, the risk of uh, combination of these uh, subgroups. And uh, so, for example, you can see uh, the risk of the male uh, diabetes and depression population, all of uh, these criteria together. And so uh, you will be able to see the incidence rate and the risk rates uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for your research actually. And so this is for readmission. Uh, and so here you can see uh, the same analysis uh, for the pain readmission. And as you can see, for example, uh, in, the, in the ATLAS, all the results have been reported based on the 1,000 person, uh, person years. And so uh, you can convert uh, these rates for one person years, for example. And so, uh, and according to uh, your research policy, uh, you can report uh, the results. So in the prediction results, uh, and we have used uh, the PLP package on Stanford Atlas. And so the PLP package is one of the uh, HADIS packages, and so uh, developed by the uh, Odyssey community. And so we, uh, in here, I would like to show you uh, the output that you can get from the PLP package and the advantage of using this uh, package in your research. Here you can see the problem definition, the prediction and definition of forward prolonged opioid use. As, uh, as you can see, we have defined, uh, actually we would like to predict uh, the, uh, the opioid drug exposure at, uh, at this specific time at risk by looking at uh, uh, six months before the surgery, a window uh, six months before the surgery. And by looking at this uh, look back window, our objective is to predict uh, the drug uh, exposure in three months and six months after the surgery. So uh, in our prediction, uh, we have used 13 types of uh, star OMA features. For example, we have used the demographics, gender, age, age groups, race, ethnicity, and we have used the main three main uh, domain-based features, procedure, condition, drug, measurement, uh, condition, error, drug, error, and also we have used uh, the procedure count, condition count, uh, drug count, and measurement count, as well as the condition group and drug groups features. And as a result of uh, all of these covariant types, we have achieved uh, 58,000 features. We also use some feature evaluation uh, based on the output of the characterization. And so uh, as a result of the characterization, we will be able uh, to evaluate uh, the, uh, all the features and based on their distribution uh, across the proline and not proline opioid users. And we can uh, select top uh, relevant features and uh, for uh, 
for uh, the six domain features, uh, we have used a different uh, feature evaluation metrics like the chi-square information gain, uh, odd ratio, and a PNF metrics. And so we have uh, we have selected top uh, relevant features uh, that their p-values uh, are less than zero. Uh, uh, 0.001. So uh, here we can see the, our results uh, achieved from the PLT package, and uh, we have evaluated uh, uh, our result in the logistic regression, last logistic regression, random forest, and Adaboost, and decision tree and NIPES. You can see we have uh, observed different behavior of the uh, machine learning algorithms and the proline opioid use. And so we have evaluated our models in different time metrics. For example, you can see in the in the second table, uh, you can see the results uh, for different time metrics. And also we have evaluated uh, the output based on uh, the strict labeling. We have used uh, uh, diagnosis codes, and uh, the def our definition of, uh, for the outcome is actually soft labeling because different uh, we have considered the three months and six months after the surgery, and so this is subjective. And so, uh, on the other hand, the exposure of uh, opioid exposure is is a soft is considered as a soft labeling, and so uh, to compare the results uh, between. Uh, the soft labeling and the strict labeling, we have used the opioid dependence uh, diagnosis codes and compared uh, these results. And as you can see, we could achieve the best uh, area under curve for when we use the strict labeling. However, the PPV value is very low. And uh, on the other hand, you can see for our uh, baseline, for example, if we consider the three months and one year after the surgery, we could achieve uh, the 72 uh, person for the uh, area under curve, and uh, we could achieve a 0 0.42 PPV value for this. Uh, so here, uh, maybe this is interesting. Uh, I, uh, I would like to show you the output of uh, the PLP package. Uh, and so, for example, for the readmission outcome, uh, we have uh, developed our uh, our models based on the P uh, PLP package. And here you can see the output. Uh, of the PLP package. And this is the uh, threshold based results. For example, uh, in the threshold zero, uh, 0 0.49, you can see uh, our, uh, uh, our results. And so uh, with respect to the last logistic regression uh, for the readmission outcome, uh, we have a good sensitivity of uh, 82 and uh, 72 for PP value. Uh, as a result of the PLP package, uh, uh, you can have the F1 score plots uh, uh, throw the, uh, over the different prediction thresholds. And so here you can see uh, the F1 score plots for uh, three different machine learning algorithms, loss of logistic vision, random forest, and doubles. And also, as a result of the PLP package, you will be able to see uh, and uh, the, uh, the rock and precision uh, recall uh, curve plots. And so, in this, for the readmission outcomes, uh, in the on the right side, you can see uh, our precision recall uh, uh, area under precision recall value that we have achieved zero point uh, uh, eighty two. And so the, the best result have been achieved by the Lassen Logistic Regression. And so uh, on the left side, you can see uh, uh, the area under curve value and the rock value uh, for the rock analysis. Also, uh, the other advantage of the PLP package is that you can see, uh, for example, uh, the calibration result. You can see the calibration results. And so here you can see for the readmission outcomes, for example, on the right side, you can see. Uh, our uh, calibration result of our model on the test set, and so, uh, so on the, on the, on the sorry, uh, on the left side you can see uh, the calibration uh, between the female and male populations, and also the different age groups. Uh, so uh, you will be able to uh, uh, to see the calibration the calibration of the model uh, uh, through the. Uh, so the different age groups, and so this is important for uh, actually for evaluate uh, 
in the in the transparency evalu in transparent evaluation and uh, for uh, a, a fair evaluation and also in the last uh, version of the PLP package we'll be able to see the decision curve analysis and so uh, this is uh, I, I think in the previous versions of the PLP package we didn't have the net benefits analysis and so in the in the recent uh, in the most recent version of the PLP package. Uh, the net benefits, uh, the net benefits analysis have been added, uh, have been included, and so uh, you will be able to uh, also uh, uh, provide a, a decision curve analysis for your research. And here you can see uh, the, uh, the net benefits uh, plots for the Lassa logistic revision and the random forest uh, for our research for the readmission outcomes. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, actually, the STAR OMO provides a standard and secure environment to conduct the clinical research. And uh, you will be able to distribute research studies across the RDC network. And also, you will be able to do external validation to evaluate the generalizability of uh, machine learning models. And finally, uh, standard evaluation of models in, in terms of transparency and fairness uh, uh, can be provided by uh, uh, the PLP package and other analysis package of the Odyssey. And uh, uh, you can use uh, all of these uh, tools in your research. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Bezad. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them to the Q&A. Uh, I know we are about 15 minutes past noon, so uh, I will, um, you know, if you have questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A, but otherwise uh, feel free, you know, to do break for lunch. Um, the workshops are scheduled to start at one. Uh, if there are those of you who, who have signed up for either the Atlas or the ACE workshop and do not yet have access, please rejoin this uh, link it'll it, it will have been it'll be a zoom link after say 12 35 so give us 20 minutes to go eat lunch and uh we will see you all there uh but we'll wait for a couple of minutes to see if anyone has any questions the preceding program is copyrighted by the board of trustees of the leland stanford junior university please visit us at med.stanford.edu